All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to ConMed's in-booth presentation, kicking off the day. This is a session entitled ConMed VR Throscopy, <laughs> bringing innovation to education. We've got two very esteemed faculty here this, this morning with Dr. Danny Goal from Vancouver, Canada. He's a shoulder surgeon and an associate professor at the uh, University of British Columbia and also the CEO of Precision OS Technologies, ConMed's VR partner. We also have Dr. Peter McDonald from Winnipeg, Canada. Pete is a shoulder and knee surgeon, and he's actually the upcoming ASES president. So we're really happy to have Pete. In 20, 2022, Pete's going to take over the American Shoulder Elbow Surgeons uh, as president, and he's past COA president and an absolute uh, legend of Canadian arthroscopy. So truly excited to have you guys here. Let's kick this off. And Danny, I'll pass it over to you. We'll get the... Uh, uh, it's wonderful to be here, Dr. McDonald, uh, to my right. And then uh, Rob, who you can't see, is around the corner, and he's actually the cameraman. And what we have here is a completely digital environment uh, that's referred to as virtual reality. And we'll go through this with Dr. McDonald in some detail, but we can do things that we just can't do in the real world. For example, interact with you know, pathologic bone in a way, and then talk about the clinical relevance. And I can pass this to Dr. McDonald, uh, and he could manipulate that as he wishes, and we can have a conversation about it through our headsets. We, uh, so actually, yeah. before we get into the OR, Pete, why don't we talk about you know, how, how did you learn when you were a resident and a fellow, and compare and contrast to what we see here in this sort of educational tool? Well, I've been around for a long time. I came from the see one, do one, teach one era, uh, and sometimes you didn't even see one or do one. You just went ahead and, and like blindly went to the operating room and did things, studying textbooks, and uh, we didn't even have videos in, the, in those days. So. Uh, I remember just a quick story, a neurosurgeon, when I was on, on neurosurgery as an orthopedic resident, we rotated through neurosurgery, uh, he was uh, uh, going to be assigned to do a craniotomy and it was like 8 o'clock in the morning and he phoned me, he said he's still in bed, I was to start the craniotomy and go as far <laughs> as I could and then just call him when I couldn't do it anymore. So that's Amazing. how I learned. Yeah. Yeah, and that's so different now because now we can, in this environment, we can see and do one as often as we want. And what's unique about this space is we can actually make mistakes and you can actually then see what errors I've made or your fellows have made or your trainees have made. And you know, when we talk about on, this, on the sales rep side, because this is now a, a training environment, as you mentioned, for not only all of us on the healthcare side, from nurses to surgeons to fellows and residents, on the medical device side, a lot of the reps that I talk to, it's always the same. They learn the most when they're in the operating room. So now we've given them an operating room to onboard them very, very quickly in this environment because they can practice, get familiar with what the uh, procedure is in more detail than ever before. The really, really unique thing about this, and Pete's to my right now, is you know you can com we've completely created a complete environment. So you know I can do things like I can raise the height of the bed up and down, which is incredible. And imagine being a hip arthroscopist starting practice and you know having done maybe 10, 12 cases as a fellow. Right. Because it's such a complex procedure. How do you increase that learning curve without actually trying to get as many patients through the room as possible? So what's incredible is I can, I can do things like I can put the limb under traction here, Pete, and I can take an x-ray and you can see how it changes the fluoro. So the hip is actually now distracted. And why don't you go ahead and pull the hip out of the joint there, Pete, and we can talk about how we understand three-dimensional anatomy. There we go. So, so when you can pull it out, you can rotate it. You can see it, the amount of distraction in the, in the joint that has resulted from the traction. So you can yeah. check uh, to make sure there's the distraction is appropriate. So Rob, is if you can focus in on that distraction, which is incredible. So you can actually now see what happens if you over or under distract. This kind of visibility into the anatomy that's relevant to a patient is incredible because now you can actually see what's actually happening and correlate what you see here on the x-ray. So. I'm going to take that hip from you for a second, Pete, which sounds funny to say. <laughs> so I'll just grab this and move it here. But what's incredible is I can actually, I'll put the limb under more traction, and you can see, so the x-ray, I haven't taken a shot yet. I'm going to go and take it, and you can see how it's even distracted even more. And, you know, the fact that I can do that and take these dynamic images is absolutely incredible. So I'm going to, I'm going to test your three-dimensional uh, spatial knowledge here, Pete, because you're a very skilled shoulder surgeon. But let's see if you can get that tactile needle uh, to the um, uh, to the cam lesion, so it's to your right. So Pete can take some some images where he can actually landmark himself with the C arm. So he's he's taking a chance here. He's looking pretty good so far. So the incredible thing is, I mean, Pete's not irradiating himself at all, obviously, because this is all digital. But it's real time. 
and you can see that X come up because he's, he's missed it a little bit. And so, you know, as you know, you and I know in the shoulder, when we're putting a scope in joint, we can actually damage the articular cartilage a lot of times if we put the scope in and out of the joint, trying to get into the joint without actually knowing where we are anatomically. We learn so much from pulling the anatomy out and seeing this three-dimensional anatomy. And again, this, this we can't do this uh, in any other sort of mode of education. So I, I trained under Pete as a medical student. Many of you may not know that, but because I'm originally from Winnipeg as well. And I have never been in the operating room with Pete since that time until today, which now we're in the virtual space. There's hundreds of surgeons around the world, perhaps thousands, that would love to be in the virtual OR with Pete to learn from how he does things, but it's not logistically possible. Uh, for him, but now Peter can actually train surgeons all over the world from his home, from Australia, New Zealand, all the way to Europe, uh, without having to do anything but have a headset and the software loaded on it. Like we all know that orthopedics is very dynamic, yeah. it's always changing, there's new technology coming in, and oftentimes it takes for a while for the surgeon to get used to a new operation, a new set of equipment. If you have the advantage of this for the surgeon to practice, the advantage of right. this for the rep to practice, and then so you're, you're much better prepared when you get to the OR with a new procedure. Yeah, I agree. And we know what it's like when you know you have a good rep and a good nursing team, the temperature of the room drops and you're just ready to go and operate. And everything's and so smooth. And everything's smooth, yeah. So that onboarding that we've seen and you know we've trained you know hundreds of reps with this technology is that the feedback has been overwhelmingly positive because they want to be able to do the procedure and to do the procedure is just not possible without a significant expense to them and time. So if it takes you know two years to have a rep get you know proficient enough to be in your OR, you know imagine cutting that down even by half or even more than that. Right. Yeah. The medicine's uh, all about like economy of time right. and, and space. Yeah. And you don't want you want to make your OR time uh, as valuable as possible. So yeah. it has to be efficient. It has to be used appropriately. Yeah. Uh, this is pretty novel, I must say. You know, doing a lot of shoulder arthroscopy myself. We don't have cannulas like this in the shoulder where you can actually adjust the size. Uh, and it makes sense in the hip because obviously there's lots of swelling in the hip, so it prevents the the uh, cannula from coming out with these ridges on the end, which I think is pretty unique. And are you still using cannulas, Pete, for uh, shoulder surgery? I do, and one of the common things is just what you alluded to, is the yeah. cannula, especially as the operation goes on and the swelling gets worse and worse, yeah. the cannula wants to back out. So if you're dealing with a, l a large individual uh, with a lot of soft tissue around the hip, and that's what makes hip, hip arthroscopy so challenging yeah. if you're dealing with a huge soft tissue sure. envelope, you need a cannula that's going to stay there. Yeah. You know, patient positioning is also something we can learn in VR. So how do you teach your, tr your fellows and your residents, Pete, about patient positioning? Because that's a critical piece to, again, be efficient and safe in the operating room. Well, right now, none of the simulators that I'm aware of yeah. can teach positioning. So this is a, an advance for, for this position, to, for, to teach how to position to teach the uh, the traction especially is so critical yeah. in uh, hip arthroscopy. So setting up the C arm, setting up the, the traction, it's critical and the, the fracture table. So repetition right now, that's the only thing we have is right. just to take the time and to be there. Uh, and this is an advance in terms of, of yeah. teaching that to residents. And it's those little things that matter, right? Like as you mentioned, it's you know where you put the post, for example, in a hip patient can make a difference between, I mean, that's one of the most common complications, I understand, how you position the foot, how you position the hip on the patients uh, on the OR table, that makes a difference. You know, how you set up traction, all those things, which we actually take for granted, are still part of the education of becoming efficient and safe in the operating room. And then part of it is learning, you know, about the table. So, I mean, uh, you know, fracture table versus a different table, what table to use, and how efficient can you get at setting that up? Because that also, as you mentioned, takes time. I've taught some courses with you, been fortunate enough to do that, and I've taught some courses all over the years. And one of my observations has been that surgeons will come to these courses, and you know everybody's ready to learn, but not everybody actually puts a set of gloves on to put their hands in a cadaver. You know, and we've actually shown now two studies, two randomized controlled trials that actually show that VR actually enhances and improves your experience on the cadaver. Right. So, you know, that's, that's taking advantage of, you know, the specimen that's been donated to say, look, I'm going to do VR before I go to the cadaver lab. Right. And I know I'm going to get much more out of it than just doing it once or maybe having a look and then going to try to do it on an actual patient. And we're fortunate enough, we have the VR, we have a simulator, and yeah. we have the actual cadaver. So it can be a progression for the resident. Exactly, yeah. So part of the unique thing about VR is we can digitally bring in all the authentic implants from ConMed. So, you know, this is th what the scope actually looks like in real life. The monitor, obviously the C-arm, uh, these are really unique things because 
when we talk about transfer of skill to the operating room, you want to be able to use the same equipment you used in your training as you do in obviously the patient. So that familiarity drives, again, efficiency in the OR. And this is interesting, right, Peak? So now I, I, get, I get tactile feedback every time I hit the bone. And what's unique is if I'm your fellow and you're, you get my data and it says, you know, Danny hit the bone 100 times, you're going to be looking at me saying, I don't think you're ready to touch a patient. And then every time I do that, these controllers vibrate, so that haptic feedback is actually quite real and palpable. So how long do you think it takes, Pete, for someone to you know, onboard for arthroscopy? Let's talk about the shoulder. Let's talk about learning curves. How long is that in your mind? Well, I mean, back to the old days again, it took about 100 cases to be proficient at doing a shoulder procedure. So uh, we're hoping like with technology like this, and the simulators we have, you can cut that in half and, and get all the basic skills before you actually get onto yeah. a patient. Yeah, and you know, we're excited because this is the first VR arthroscopy simulator that I'm aware of that actually can allow you to do this and have a 2D or a screen in a screen uh, all in headset where I'm actually doing what I would do in the operating room. Well, part of this is where it's going to go in the future, right? This is a, a beginning uh, of a, a really exciting era of surgical training. And where is it going to go in the future? Well, maybe we'll have uh, virtual reality goggles on when we're operating on a real person. I have Danny in, in Vancouver telling me what I'm doing with a shoulder procedure at the same time as we're operating. So. There's a, the potentials for this are limitless, and uh, I think that this is super exciting. Be interesting to see what happens with this over the next 10 years. Yeah, it's an excellent point, Pete, and you know, we're at the academy now, and we know that surgeon numbers are down, but this is an opportunity for us to engage learners from all over the world in a digital space, because they come to this meeting for education, and what better way to offer the most innovative and the most far-reaching mode of hands-on experience than through VR. And to elaborate on you know, uh, Bruce's question, how I see this progressing is, you know, we start off early, we start off at you know, the medical student stage to get people interested in orthopedics, and that's how I became interested in orthopedics, was being a medical student in Dr. McDonald's operating room. And you know, I saw him operate, and I was like, you know, this is something that I could actually see myself doing. We need to start there, and that's where VR plays a role, and it crosses all the way up to being a surgeon in practice, or as Pete mentioned, a surgeon who's experienced that wants to learn a new procedure, a new technique, and they want to onboard very quickly. So you can see me burying the bone there. Yeah, he's getting health, like warning signs not to burr healthy yeah. bone. Yeah, so you can see it's actually telling me that uh, I'm resecting a normal bone. And you know, I can, I can go and I can resect quite a bit here. And the dynamic part of this, Pete, is you know, you can watch me and I can move this monitor out of the way. And I'm going to drag the C-arm over as well, because I can. And let's have a look at this x-ray here to see how I'm doing. And the other thing we haven't talked about is patients. Some, some patients are getting more and more educated about their procedure and they right. want to actually see what you're going to do. Yeah. So th you can see the potential of uh, putting patient under these goggles and actually taking them through the procedure so that they understand exactly the nuances of this yeah. the surgery and what you're doing. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Pete. And you know, you're absolutely 100% right in that patients want more information. Right. And we're in, a, we're in an era of in information. So they want to see what's going to happen, what you're going to do. And you know, there may come a time where patients may ask you, you know, Dr. McDonald, do you train in VR or do your residents train in VR before they do my case? Right. Yeah. Or else getting the confidence of the patient up that you know how to work the VR and take, uh, take, uh, take yourself through the procedure right. quite efficiently with the VR. Yeah. And, and then it inspires the patients in term, terms of confidence of, of your ability to do, yeah. the, to do the procedure. So. So Pete, one thing we didn't talk about is you know onboarding into the headset. So how long did it take you to learn, you know, how to get the headset on, turn it on, and you know use the controllers? How long do you think that took you? You know, it's a bit of a learning curve, but you can take it home and practice. It takes you a couple of times, and then you start to pick up, you know, the li different buttons on right. the, the handsets, what they do, how to log in, all these things. So it, it's it's fun. I even got my kids to put it on at home. Yeah. And they loved it, right? Yeah. So. yeah, a massive thank you to uh, our special guest faculty, Peter. It's so good to see you, and uh, thank you so much for your support on this. Uh, Danny, the Precision <laughs> OSO team, Rob, John, Craig, Kevin, everyone on the rest of the team back, uh, back in Vancouver, thank you all. Um, this is really great, and uh, have a fantastic day, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. All right, Pete.